Um, just to clarify, uh, you were here last week or watched online, Liz Truss was not my Enneagram teacher. <laughs> I don't know how many of you noticed that. It was Liz West. I don't know why Liz Truss was on my mind, but Liz West, who was my Enneagram teacher. Uh, a little bit of an update. Uh, I did meet up with the Imam um, Idris last week for a, a few hours one afternoon at the mosque, and it was so good to do that. And, uh, oh, yeah, just to, just to be reminded of some of the overlaps of our faith and love, mercy, justice. Uh, but also some of the differences, some significant differences. But that's okay as well. That was, it was relationally. We spent time together, both trusted each other, could ask each other things like um, different views of what we do. Um, but really good. And yeah, that will continue as well on, a, on that relational basis. So, so good. Uh, the series we are continuing today, The Way to Our Essence, and some of you will know, if you haven't been here for any, or um, if you yeah, have missed any of them, then you can watch online if you'd like to. They do come in three, so they build. Uh, might be good to go back and listen to some to do a bit of a refresher as well. And if you're trying to work out perhaps what type you are, that might be helpful as well. We've looked at shame, we've looked at fear, and this week we're looking at anger. The Richard Raw, you probably have heard of Richard Raw, and I went through this book again, which is called The Immortal Diamond, The Search for Our True Self, and so good to go along with this series, so good to go along with the whole of the series we're doing, the wider series we're doing as well, and if you would like to know more about this idea that inside each of us there is this pure, holy godly essence, goodness, uh, maybe very different to the teaching you've had in the past, some of us have had in the past, uh, this original blessing, and that diamond within you is immortal, that is your soul, that is what will last forever, and there are two books that uh, feel free to borrow, or feel free to borrow The Road Back to You, which is another good summary, really good summary of the Enneagram, so pop along after the service if you'd like to borrow of them. For those who prefer Audible, they're also on Audible, all of them. Um, Peter is leading, he is leading the service next week, and we... <coughs> I love this. A couple of weeks ago, uh, one of our members, who wants to remain anonymous for, for probably obvious reasons, she came up to me after the service and said, was very distraught and said that somebody very close to her, quite young as well, is dying, and they've now died, in very, 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 very sad circumstances. And they have gave me permission to say this. Um, she asked me, our church member asked me, is it okay to be angry with God? No, she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, of course you can. And then she said, is it okay to be angry with God? And I said, oh, fantastic, an easy one to answer. Because they're not always easy. And I said, yes, totally. I hope so. Totally okay to be angry with God. And then I nearly went on to the next bit, what, which is why I think actually God isn't responsible for this. And, and, but I said, no, I'm not going to go there. I want you to stay angry. Stay with where you're at. Stay with that anger and chat with God about it. And it also reminded me that before I was a Christian, I cried out in anger to a God I didn't believe in. And I think that was the start of our, what you might call a relationship. That was the early days of our relationship. I think God wants us to be authentic. I think God wants us to, for our sake and for his enjoyment, be our true self before God. He enjoys our authenticity and loves us regardless. And we're now going to hear a psalm from David. And of course, if we ever wonder if it's okay to be angry with God, not this psalm, 
but other psalms where David is crying out to God. But let's for now hear from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Thank you. Thank you very much. I invite you to stand if you're willing to hear. So, 
little reminder, again, if you've been here, um, that we're looking through the lens of a personality tool called the Enneagram. Uh, again, um, if you've missed previous ones, especially the first one, I guess, where I explained some of the idea behind us all having a false persona. We have this essence, this diamond, this thing that has been there from the beginning and will remain our pure essence, but for various reasons, and not to be hard on ourselves, our minds, our bodies are very clever, that our, our little vulnerable little things as we're babies and children growing up, and this complicated world, we learn all these defences to try and cope and get by, and we take on these different personality characteristics that we think will help us survive. Um, they, just, they just pass their cell by day, and they end up um, being a little bit of a prison. Uh, but it, it's a big thing to get our heads around, and can be quite daunting. And this idea, which I believe wholeheartedly, that we, to some degree or another, all have this mask that we wear. We wear. I guess, I guess we know that anyway. You know, who, who can actually feel free to be totally themselves and knows totally who they are. So it is good news, but it can be daunting as well. Really good when people identify with the type and are willing to come and have a chat with me at the front here. So we're going to do that in, in a minute. But this morning we're going to look at what's called the body types, the gut types. And again, a lot of information, but we have different centres of intelligence, either the head, the heart, uh, or the gut, the body, through which we take in information from the world and process information. These neurons are sending things to our brains. And with this gut type, the body type, they tend to mainly do that from the body, from the gut centre. And one of the emotions which is linked to that in particular is anger as well. So for the heart types, it was shame was a key emotion. For the head types, it was fear is the key emotion. And for this morning, it's anger. We all have all of those things, but perhaps these types we're going to look at today are more, more of a challenge with anger. The eight, who's a good eight? I wonder who a good name would be. Would it be somebody like this? Oh, blue eyes. Apparently, yes. We don't ever use the Enneagram, but apparently, yes. Called the Challenger, the eight, the type eight, the protector. And one of his sayings was, don't get even, get mad. That says a lot about the type eight. There's this belief that the world is hard and unjust, and a phrase going round unconsciously, perhaps, the weak go to the wall. Their relationship with anger, they are, this is the type, actually, which is quickly in touch with their anger and more comfortable showing their anger, expressing it, and sometimes quite strongly, and then it passes. So, free with their anger, and then it passes. A tendency to approach things in an all or nothing way, especially if something really matters to the family, or it could be standing up for a justice issue. They like to be strong, honest, and dependable. What you see is what you get. They're prone to taking the lead in life. They find it hard not to show their feelings when they're angry. And this is really key for them. They really don't like to show vulnerability. Vulnerability is a no-no, especially if they're less aware and more stuck in that time. They have a big lustful energy for life. Lust, the German lust, the real energy for life. With the Type 7 last week, it was this kind of gluttony where liking to have a lot of lots of different things and a little bit. With the Type 8, it's they want a lot of the same thing and then that thing. So it's not just nibbling at things, it's a lot really getting into something. Get bored quickly. One of the things I found most helpful, and actually helped me have more compassion for type eights, because they can sometimes be quite scary, is that they have a teddy bear's heart in a suit of armour. So they look quite formidable and quite strong, but actually underneath. And that really came to home to me when I trained up in Birmingham with the Enneagram, and there was a Scottish comedian who was a type eight on the course. And she was quite scary to begin with, but then she was in my group. 
and I grew very fond of her and she had a real, real warm heart and this tough exterior actually, she managed to get in touch with her vulnerability and show what she was really like. They can be impulsive, they can act first then think later, often repressed or pushed round as children, you can see where this persona comes from. They want to be direct with people and they can pick up when somebody is not being very straight with them, when they're being a bit deceptive or lying or manipulative. They don't often tolerate weakness in other people unless they understand where it's coming from and they really like it if that person is trying to do something about it as well, they respect that, they admire that. They can be demanding, provocative, intimidating and one of the ways they create intimacy is actually through conflict, through fighting. They want to go for you and you to come back and you could look. And actually that is a form of intimacy that they can enjoy. They don't usually have to announce their presence. I know a number of Type A's, and actually Liz West, who trained us, is a Type A. You go into a room and they're there, you can feel the energy from them. Or when they come into a room, oh my word, somebody's come in, it's them. That is often a Type A. Because they have trouble showing their vulnerability, that can sometimes be a problem in relationships, and you can imagine why. They don't like following orders, especially if they don't agree with the person or don't respect the person giving them orders. They don't always know their own physical limitations. They often think they're bigger and stronger than they are. And this is key. They would rather be respected than liked. Us type twos want to be liked. Respect's okay as well, but for the type eight, they would rather be respected than liked. Like, hard admitting its mistakes, because if you admit a mistake, in their eyes, it might show a weakness. After all, after all life is all about survival of the fittest, and a real aversion to being controlled. So that's the challenger, the protector, the type eight. And now we move on to the type nine. And for this, have asked Ant to come, or Ant's volunteered to come. So the mediator, the peacemaker, and Barack Obama identifies as this type. And one of his sayings is, no drama. He's mellow, calm, and a good listener. And works. one of his gifts is working hard at finding the middle ground. Can we show Ant our support as he comes? <laughs> So the first question is, um, how did you first hear about the Enneagram? Uh, yeah, I think it might have been through you, um, but probably I was just looking at a podcast. It might have been a podcast you'd recommended when you were looking into it, so I am, um, maybe 2017? That was when I just checked the podcast when it started, I'm pretty sure I was on it um, then. So probably about that, that time, so quite a few years. Quite a few years. And dipping into it on and off throughout that time, how easy has it, or was it, to recognise your type as a type 9? I'm not sure it was that easy to start with. I would read all of the, or listen to everything, and I think maybe the same for other people that I identify with quite a lot of the types. Um, we've got a bit of everything on the side, but I identify with a lot of all those. So it wasn't particularly easy, and then having spent a bit more time, I guess I just um, felt like I'd I identified with nine and that resonated a bit more with yeah with me than the others yeah and that's interesting in itself because the type nine is strong on empathy and they can see other people's points of view so that's a common characteristic that they can actually identify with a lot of the types the numbers and um, so that that's kind of like a little bit of a clue that somebody might be a nine as well uh, what, what is it what comes to mind when you think about the characteristics of a type nine that do resonate with you? Um, yeah, it's interesting because I was quite into it, I think, quite a few years ago, and I would spend quite a lot of time listening to all the podcasts because it was kind of helpful on a journey of self awareness and working myself out a little bit more, which I find, yeah, kind of, well, necessary. Um, but it's just, I think it's that. You know, the, not the mediator necessarily, because I wouldn't say that I feel comfortable sitting in the middle and trying to discuss. Uh, um, but definitely the, the conflict thing, I think, is kind of quite key for me, as I don't like conflict. 
So those are, those are those interesting things, which I'll try and avoid conflict at all costs. And I like people to be, I like everyone just to get on and be happy um, and be comfortable with each other and yeah, we'll avoid, yeah, we'll avoid conflict. That's a, an area of growth for me. Um, it has was, been. Has been an area of growth for me. Yeah, just understanding that some of these types are good Yeah, positives that I can take out of it. I was just listening to a podcast, kind of refreshing my memory on like what I am as a nine. If I identify as a nine, that um, what's it? I wrote it down because I was trying to remember it like three or four times, and then I was telling Mike, "Oh, this is really interesting," or, or you can judge whether it's interesting or not. Um, but I couldn't remember it. So even having listened to it like <laughs> half a dozen times, I still couldn't remember it. So like a healthy place for me is. Uh, but healthy conflict is better than fake harmony. Um, so that's been an area of um, what that I really identify as and an area that I really need to grow in being comfortable to have my own view. So, so for you, why, why, is, why is healthy conflict better than, than fake harmony? Could you say that you that? Yeah, because I think I've lived in fake harmony for quite a long time. Um, well, I'll internalise where I'm not particularly comfortable with how I'm being treated or um, I feel like I'm really accommodating to everyone and everything. A bit like saying yes to interviews when, <laughs> when, 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 without giving it proper thought. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, so you want to do this? Surely there are other nines in the room. Yeah, yeah, it's, but the healthy conflict, yeah, having, being allowed to be your yourself, understanding yourself a bit more and I mean that kind of comment was particularly within relationships and it's within relationships that um, that's been highlighted um, and through other kind of um, you know 12 step fellowships and sort of therapy, not that I like that word, but um, have all highlighted that I can have my voice and it's alright to say no and it's alright to go actually I don't like spoke to me or having, you know, putting myself in positions where I might have conflict as a result is a healthy place for me to be. And this, it says as well, uh, if a type 9 is starting to be like disliked by a few people, then they're probably in a healthy place because they're so accommodating normally that you never get any conflict, you always get love and Passion and understanding and things like that. And if you start to become kind of not like that, then then you're probably being a little bit healthier. With, with the eight, so the eight type eight is the, the, the type which is more comfortable in expressing anger. Um, what's your relationship with anger, Bonnie? And say what you want to don't want to. Yeah, never angry, really. Again, I internalise it, so maybe gut resonates with me. Um, because when you read out type A, um, quite happy with that, I'm just not happy with that at all. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, passive aggressive came up when I was just sort of refreshing my memory. And for me, if I ever get to the stage where I'm going to vocalise my anger and frustrations with anyone or anything, then or to passive aggressive sarcasm, which is my default. Yeah, not really enjoyed by my other half. Um, she would much prefer me to say exactly what I'm not happy with. Um, whereas I will do it in sarcasm because it feels like it's jokey uh, and comfortable. Um, but yeah, most of the time my anger and frustration is internalised and because I'm so, because maybe as a type it's so accommodating um, and generally want to get on with people, uh, avoiding conflict, um, then that's how I treat people. And as a result, I expect everyone to treat me in exactly the same way. So I have this narrative in my head of how you should be treating me based on the fact of how I would be treating you, but you have absolutely no idea that that narrative exists. You know. What, what's going on for uh, an unaware and all different, very 
Asians Awareness at type, eight, at type 9 is that if I show my preferences and what I really want in life, and especially if I show anger, then I'm going to push people away and our harmony, our peace is going to break down and I'm going to lose these, these people or this group. So this is, this is going on behind. And it's, it's the type in the middle who are said to be asleep to anger. So again, not talking about and and can identify with what you can identify with, but uh, uh, an unaware of type nine will be one of the most angry, angrier than the type eight. But actually, they go to sleep to their anger, and they're, they're not aware of their anger. And so, what can often come out and touched on it is that passive aggressive. Um, on on one level as well, they might agree to do something because they don't want to cause conflict. Um, but then they might forget about it or not turn up. Um, there's that, that kind of passive aggressive side to it. Um, also, I think you've touched on this. Uh, they're sometimes called the wallflower in a group, that they will go to a party or be in a room and they'll want to be at the back, they'll want to be on the side, and they won't want to be noticed. But I love this, if they're not noticed, then they can feel a bit passive aggressive as well. So there's kind of like this tension going on. Um, and I think you said about that, you, you being the centre of attention and, and in a group or whatever, that, that's you'd rather be sitting back and... Yeah, uh, introverted, I think. Mm. Um, referring to your little, um, I thought it was interesting when you asked for a sort of a, a hands up, ask an introvert to put their hands up. But yeah, I definitely, yeah, I definitely never, I don't think I ever want to be the centre of attention. Mm. Um, I'm okay in, a group, in groups of people that I'm comfortable with, um, and then I'm a bit more extrovert, or at least display how I'm feeling. But yeah, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, never really want to be noticed, I guess, in, in, in big gatherings or anything. Just quite happy to observe, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sit there and watch. The types, some of you will know this, the types, each of us have a different a vice or a passion, an unhealthy thing, and, um, and, and something that where we go to when we're healthier. So a virtue is called a virtue. And, and this is the one I know type nine is often cringe. Um, and and the, the, the vice or the passion is, is sloth. Isn't that a horrible word, sloth? Unless, not the sloths, of course. Um, and it can be misleading because type nines are often very, 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 very busy, really hard at work and doing lots of things. But the idea is that uh, the important stuff, something that really has to be done, maybe the important inner work, they would rather do everything but that, so potter around the house, do this, that and the other, uh, rather than making that really important phone call that they know they have to make especially if it could be a bit kind of like, oh, they would rather do the washing up and go for a walk and, and do the guardian, that kind of thing. So it, it's, they're not lazy, but it's a going asleep to the important stuff. Does that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, mm. definitely. Putting off things that I don't want to do. Mm. Um, yeah, I was listening to the sloth bit as well. And I can identify with being lazy. Um, or not being lazy, but in fact, I don't think there's anything wrong with it understanding that I need time as much. Um, but yeah, 100% I'll, I'll need to be doing something sometimes. And to make myself feel better for not doing the thing that I should be doing, then I'm doing things like, exactly, like you said, cleaning or, or washing up. Feeling like I'm still achieving something, but in actual fact putting off the, the things that really should be done. You know, homework was a great example of that when I was younger. Tidy my room perfectly for the whole evening and just put off that up until the point where there's no ability to put it off, like deadlines. I work quite well under, well, I'll leave things to the basic so there's just about enough time. Till it has to, to be done. Yeah, till they have to be done. In case if you don't do them, it might cause conflict as well. Yeah, well, um, yeah, anything can avoid conflict. Yeah. But it's good to understand these things. That's why I think any of these things that give you more self awareness of how you are yourself. Mm. Um, good and bad is, you know, whatever medium you take, or would it be it, um, this or, you know, whatever else, it's just a, gives you a better insight in yourself so that you can, you can notice these things within yourself. Um, 
And it may be one last question, unless and add an whatever you want to add. Um, we were chatting beforehand, but um, and I was chatting with a few of you actually uh, over, over the weeks. So some people not interested in the Enneagram tool at all, which is fine. Uh, for some, it doesn't resonate or connect, uh, which is fine. Some people are, but haven't had time really to explore it much further. Others have really benefited from it. But one of the things Anne and I were talking about is just one of many tools. My, my personal favourite, um, but um, it's just one of many tools. And, and you were saying for you, it's just been one of those things. And there's lots of other things as well, choices about self-awareness. Uh, yeah, as I say, I was quite, quite into it. Um, in, in a sense, a few years ago, I uh, found it quite quite helpful. Um, but it, yeah, it's honestly not something that I rely on or look at, or not that I'm not interested in it. But I have, you know, quite a few people know I have other areas that I kind of enforce into self awareness, really. Um, not something that I do by choice to a certain degree. Um, but out of, yeah, 12 step fellowships. Uh, therapy, other other things have been, you know, they give me a similar insights, but I value this because it just reminds me, I think firstly it's helpful to be open to it, um, which as I say, I was kind of forced into being open to it, but it's interesting to understand yourself. Um, and to, be, to a certain degree, I wouldn't need uh, the Enneagram or any of the other things if other people in the world didn't exist. <laughs> um, I think I'd be fine. <laughs> okay, generally, I'd be all right if yeah. I was just, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't get me wrong, I love, I love yeah. lots of people, but uh, I think, you know, conflict and all these things, I wouldn't have conflict mm. generally if there was no one else around. Mm. And life only gets annoying and confusing because there are other people in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Which forces you to have, you know, to look at what, what's your part in all of this mm. or what's my part in this. Mm. And, you know, is it all right to tell someone that? Actually, I, I didn't enjoy that conversation, um, especially in relationships, and don't talk to them like that, or, or whatever it might be, and to put yourself in um, an uncomfortable situation to to have better communication. Um, but yeah, I, I, I quite enjoy the Enneagram, and we'll listen to it a bit more. Um, but yeah, it's good. And not bad being compared to that. Yeah, well, well, it's what was I saying earlier? It's yeah. like, I will add one thing, yeah. and, and all this leads for me is to try and be the, like the healthiest version of myself that I can be, and, and that's, that's really how it works. Wonderful. For me. Thank you so much. Good, good place to end. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, for this morning, so again, um, the, the other body type, it's the type one who's called the reformer or the perfectionist, and what a lovely pair of people, because we have... Michelle Obama as well. Um, always looking for, this is her apparently, always looking for improvement and pushing herself to be better. Uh, her motto is, when they go low, we go high. And if you've read her book, um, Becoming, you'll see how much she struggles with her inner critic as well. That's a key thing for the type one. And this re relentless self-questioning of, am I good enough? And Peter's going to join me for probably 10 minutes or so, and should we show Peter our love as well? So you actually introduced me, I think, to the idea of the Enneagram. How did you first hear about it? It was again our uh, friend Richard Raw, I think. Um, I'd already read, well, you'd read some of his books before, and I'd read uh, Falling Upward and watched some of his videos on YouTube, and that kind of led me to his videos on the Enneagram that I was very suspicious at first. Um, but then, in general, I was kind of a bit like unsure about personality kind of types and the whole idea of it. But what struck me about the Enneagram is that it's kind of, there's a different aspect that other personality types doesn't. And I think it's to do with that focus on like sin, which in a, in a Christian tradition is kind of like a big part of uh, you know, theology, and I found that really interesting that, that, that actually it takes sin seriously, and there's, um, you know, and there's something that, uh, something that can be healed and we can grow, and sin can become less destructive in the world, we become more aware of what we do, so we, we become less like we know not what we do, 
that's when we begin to know, and then we can change. And, and for you, how easy was it for you to identify as a type one? Uh, it, was, it was really easy, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, when I was, when I was reading the first Enneagram book, I read um, one, two, three, and nine all resonated. So it was like that kind of area of the Enneagram, but one really resonated, so um, above, above all. And so this, this, will be, this will be fascinating. Um, so what, what parts of the, the type one, the perfectionist, um, resonate most with you? So, I mean, the perfectionist, I, I, I don't have any idea of being a perfectionist particularly, um, although some have described me in that way. I like, I prefer the word reformer. Um, but I suppose it's that kind of idea that um, I love, um, that idea where when they go low, we go high. It's like that idea that we could make things better. You know, we could make things better in the world or in our relationships. There's there's a way that we could improve this. We could reform this. Um, and I suppose that's kind of the lens I come to um, in the world. So yeah, there can be that kind of like perfectionism, but then. Um, I, I think it's 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 rather than like nitpicking, it's more about the ideal and these kind of big ideas of like justice and what is good and what is you know good for society and uh, why why can't we make things better? I'm hmm. wanting to do something well. Is that yeah? Wanting to yeah. do something well. Um, in terms of um, anger. So, yeah, could you, could you say, you know, generally how the Type 1 deals with anger and, and where you are with that as well? Yeah, so with the Type 1, the anger, uh, well, most Type 1s, first of all, will say they're not angry at all. And I certainly would be one of them as well, but, but this is not something I want to associate myself with, especially as a 1's kind of big fear is of being bad or corrupt. So the idea that a 1 is angry, you know, you don't want to even think about that but actually um, what's going on is kind of your anger it gets uh, suppressed or repressed however I don't, don't know what the right word would be but um, and, and you are kind of angry within a lot of self-criticism um, so rather than being an outward thing it's kind of like uh, like a like simmering kind of thing on the inside rather than that other thing. And I was just thinking with Ant, um, again, not flattering or buttering you up, just trying to be real with both of you. Um, one of the things that, that has, has relaxed the, the type for Ant is that self awareness and growth. And again, with you, um, you know, we worked together for seven, eight years, and the, this never got in the way, um, you know, the reforming side, the perfectionist side, never got in the way. And not wanting to embarrass you, not wanting to flatter you either, but my guess is, well, I know your self-awareness has grown over the last seven, eight years. How, how has your type relaxed over the last seven years or so, do you think? Yeah, well, Thanks for saying you didn't get in the way. I think that's partly because you're very gracious, uh, you know, at points as well. So, um, uh, yeah, how's it relaxed? Um, I think kind of ones tend to have this intense personal responsibility. So they will, you know, come to the, to, to things thinking that they are so responsible for for something. Um, I suppose over time recognizing that it's not just it's not just me that's responsible um you know in church together we were responsible we were responsible you know this concentric circle's got wider and god obviously you know responsible and um and recognizing that it's not just down to me and, and that's the case with all sorts of different things um in, in life and so um i think also being able to let go of the responsibility sometimes um, so um, yeah, being able to to relax and um, rest and you know take time away, take time off, and um, yeah, just um, 
be able to let go of responsibility so that I can kind of embrace other parts of who I am. I heard one of the Enneagram teachers and listeners to the podcast as well, uh, Beatrice and Urania Pai, and, and he, he, he has a little joke with, with type ones. He said that the only type who he says, get worse, don't improve, just get worse. And uh, I was just thinking um, that, that one of the things we haven't touched on as well is that when types are relaxed or in health, they go to another number, another, another, um, and for the one, they, they go to the seven, um, which we saw last week, the enthusiast. And, uh, so when, when there's no responsibility, when you're on holiday or whatever, um, do, you, do you see your type shift to the seven? Yeah, for sure. Even now, like, I'm not away on holiday, but I'm not taking a few days holiday a week uh, with Jenny, and like I'm, I'm finding that I can be kind of more spontaneous and playful and think all of these things that like I guess I've shut down, you know, or might have shut down my state because I've been focused on work or whatever. So um, yeah, I think it's it's like recognizing, um, yeah, almost the, the inner critic, which is a big thing for ones I think you mentioned earlier. Um, the inner critic's voice gets quieter and quieter, um, and you can just, you know, relax and, yeah, um, be more playful with things and um, enjoy life, um, you know, allow yourself to enjoy things more. Anything else you'd like to add to that time? I think um, the one's kind of path to growth is towards serenity and um, and that might be a little bit different, this kind of idea of serenity might be a bit different in this context from other contexts, but I think the idea of it is being able to accept reality as it is, that's a big part of it, and um, you know, um, and I think that's really important for me, because obviously when you're constantly trying to improve things, you can't always see the beauty of what is right in front of you, just being able to accept yourself, others, um, love, you know, uh, how can you love things that you're constantly trying to improve, actually no, you need to be able to just love them. <laughs> <laughs> and just yeah, and, and accept them as as they are. Recognize your part is um, you know it, it's not you trying to reform the thing. Actually, we're partnering together on this journey. Yeah, I love that. Thank you very much as well. Thank you. Going to we were going to have a song. We're going to play it to the end of the service, and now we're going to. With that in mind, with everything about you, about this world in mind, we're going to be led in a prayer now. And, and if you'd like to say Amen to this prayer, then please do say Amen to this prayer. Dear God, you are present through the universe and in the smallest and most fragile creature. We embrace with tenderness all things that exist. Fill us with the power of your love. Help us to conserve beauty and life. Help us produce beauty and not ugliness. Teach us to discover the worth of each creation and be filled with awe and contemplation. Fill us with your peace that we may live as siblings, harming no one. Empower us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten, precious in your eyes, God of the poor. Touch those whose hearts only look for gain, careless of the poor and of our planet. Teach us to discover how deeply we're united as we journey towards your light together. Thank you for your presence every day. Give us courage in our daily struggle. May we work for justice. May we work for love. May we all be instruments of peace. Amen. And turn to scripture now and hear from John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. 
When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all the temple court, drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, "Get out of here! Stop turning my father's house into a market." His disciples remembered that it is written, "Zeal for your house will consume me." I just um, also, as just after that, swung to myself, my comment to Peter, your, your type didn't get in the way of us working together. More than that, it enhanced our working together. And I just wanted to share that because it sounded a bit more negative than it was meant. The way to our essence, anger. Anyone get angry? Anyone repress anger? Anyone in denial about anger? Well, let's think about Jesus. We think about Jesus, the exemplar. Jesus is the exemplar of a fully integrated person. What that looks like when they're living out of their essence totally. No mask, no false persona, no defences at all. And, so this is important when we think about anger. Jesus not only felt anger, Jesus expressed anger. So anger isn't necessarily wrong, isn't necessarily bad or unhealthy. Elsewhere, and I love this, John tells us Jesus was so angry, and the translation of the Greek is that he snorted like a horse, an angry horse. Jesus could get that angry. On that occasion, he was angry at death when his friend Lazarus was dead, had died, and that was what it stirred with inside Jesus. The word for today's reading was zeal. That was zeal, zeal for his father's house, the temple. And Jesus, in this reading, does seem to be acting with some anger. Why is Jesus angry? So coming up to the Passover, coming to Jerusalem, going to the temple, to his father's house, gets angry. Why was Jesus angry? Sermons I heard years ago would say something like this, because he thought it was so wrong that things were being bought and sold in this central place for Jewish worship. We can't get our heads around it, but the temple in Jerusalem, the way that this building, this place was esteemed and looked to, it was the heart of Judaism. And his father's house, the temple, had turned into a market. And it was worse, the sermons would go on to say, because there was also extortion going on, that people were selling the animals the doves needed for sacrifice at higher rates than they should have. And people were coming from different lands, they had to exchange their money for the money used in the temple, and they were being charged too much for that as well. Years later, I discovered why Jesus was as angry as Jesus was. Why was he that angry? Picture in your minds the temple. On the outskirts of the temple, the outer sides of the temple, you had the outer court. So you had all these different courts that got closer and closer to the Holy of Holies within the temple. This was the court of the Gentiles. Between that court and the next court, there was a five foot wall. And if you tried to go through it when you weren't allowed to, you would be killed. That was through to the court of the women. The next court, going closer and closer to the centre, was the court of the men. Then the next court was the court of the priests. And then within the Holy of Holies, where God's specific presence was promised, only one person, the high priest, could go in once a year. So this court of the Gentiles, picture it on the outskirts, was open to... Gentiles, non-Jews, to foreigners, and those who were considered impure for one reason or another. But this important place to give access to people on the outside had become a crowded bazaar and was crowding out the people who were already on the fringes, those who already had limited access to God. This, I believe, is why Jesus was so angry. 
Jesus would eventually make this stone temple and the sacrificial system based around it in Jerusalem obsolete, outdated. After that, God's temple would be made from stones of flesh, all of us, with God's Spirit coming to dwell specifically within people. When Jesus brought that in, there would be total equal access for everybody to worship, to approach God. Jew, Gentile, whatever ethnicity, whatever nationality, whatever gender, whatever gender identity. No imperfections would exclude anybody from this temple of flesh. For example, we see in scripture that the eunuchs who weren't allowed originally to the temple were specifically to be part of that as well, as they should, as everybody should. But before this next improved, better, evolved stage, as Jesus entered the stone temple as it was, he was angry at this injustice and the exclusion. His was a righteous anger. An important side note. Does it remind you of anything else? It reminds me of something else very specific to do with us. I think it's the same motivation that Worthing Baptist Church had becoming an affirming church. Our LGBTQ inclusion and affirmation. People who are being crowded out of churches by what I believe, my conviction, is outdated attitudes, like in the old temple system. You can come in, remember the wall, five foot wall? You can come in, but only this far, and then you're going to hit a wall. You can come in, but can you be baptised? Can you become a member? Could you become a leader? Could you become a minister? In this church, the walls have been blown away and taken down as they should. Nobody is excluded. Nobody will hit a wall in that church. And that simply seems right and just as it should be. So anger can be good and healthy, and righteous even. It's one of a range of God-given emotions. And it's healthy with emotions to feel what we feel, and unhealthy to repress or deny emotions. The important thing is how you express, how we express anger that's key. Ephesians chapter 4 is helpful with this in mind. We're told, don't sin in your anger. Don't sin in your anger. Don't hurt other people with your words, with your physically or in any way when you're angry. But anger in itself isn't sinful. It is such a complex emotion. We can have a complex relationship with it. I did have a very complex relationship with anger. I had, I never go into too much detail, but let me say a mother who expressed anger inappropriately when I was a child. Because of her stuff, I can have grace towards that and forgiveness towards that. But I became really fearful of anger, on edge if ever I could sense any anger. And because of my stuff linked up with all of that, I had lots of fights at primary school, lots of fights at secondary school. And confession time, I was often the one who hit out first. There was no excuse, and it was not pure righteous anger, although, although, I tell myself anyway, and it's true, it was sometimes when I was standing up for people being bullied. That was a bit of a theme, but no justification. As a minister, you might be pleased to know that while I have felt anger, I can't recall a time, doesn't mean there isn't, but I can't recall a time where I reacted in anger. I've never raised my voice, I've never hit anybody, you'll be pleased to know. And I've never used words that I can recall anyway, where I intended to hurt somebody with my words. I've become more comfortable with feeling anger, and that, given my childhood, is a big thing. I listen to my anger. 
I found anger over the years a really useful clue as to something that might be wrong community-wise, relationship-wise, dynamic-wise within the church. A sense when something might be, is that because something feels unjust, LGBT exclusion? Is it because there's some kind of violation going on? Is there some kind of bullying going on within the church? Surely not within churches, yes. Is there some kind of bullying going on or manipulation? With this in mind, for ministers, but for each of us, it is so useful to have counsel about our emotions, about anger, checking it out with somebody else, and also why it is so important to have self-awareness, all of us growing self-awareness, to work out if our anger, if my anger, is actually to do with my ego, an ego reaction because of pride or fear or projection onto somebody else. So you need to have self-awareness to some degree and people to check it out with. So you own it if it's yours. But if not, mm, it's telling me something about something going wrong here. Maybe it's justified. Again, what is your relationship like with anger? What is your relationship like with anger? What's it really like? I say that because through even this morning our exploration, exploration of the Enneagram and over the series and actually over the years the importance of understanding about the unconscious, about defences, about the ego, about false persona. It's reminded us that it might be more complex for each of us than at first it appears because of the unconscious, because of repression, because of denial. It's very, very common for us to think that anger is not an issue for us, when actually it's simmering away like a bubbling lid on a hot boiling pot of water. Maybe exploding one day, bang, the lid comes off. Or maybe just simmering, bits coming out every now and then. Maybe coming out in passive aggressiveness. Or irritation. Or even grumpiness. Or linked to depression. Not always, but sometimes anger is depression, or depression rather is anger turned inwards. But Mike, if it isn't hurting other people, why not just not let it be and get on with our lives? Why all this navel-gazing and introspection? Well, what if it's hurting you? Your health? Your mental health? Or at the very least, getting in the way of your living life to the full, which Jesus wants you to do. You're living out of your essence. Let's just briefly explore anger. It can be good, it can be a clue that something's wrong, it can energise, it can motivate, it can really give us an energy. Kate doesn't mind me saying that she is a type 9 as well, the peacemaker, who's very averse to conflict. But one little story, years ago in Waitrose, down in Havant, when somebody was being rude to her gran, an elderly lady, that was too much. So Kate went to right action and stood up for her gran. It can lead to vigils in towns, peaceful vigils in towns. It can include or lead to inclusion of those who are excluded. Something about Christians, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're very good at what's called spiritual bypass, generally. Or having a spiritual bypass. For example, when it comes to forgiveness, Spiritual bypass is, I'm a Christian, the Bible says I must forgive, I must forgive, so I have forgiven. Have you? Have you done the hard work of forgiveness? And it's similar with anger. Only righteous anger is okay, for the Bible tells me so. So whenever I get angry, I am going to dress it up, guess what, as righteous anger. You hear that so much. 
or the impression so much. Many years ago in this church, I remember somebody asking me to come for tea with them. And the specific reason is because they wanted me to preach against homosexuality. That was the reason. Preach against, I don't hear much preaching against homosexuality. You can imagine, I was just kind of, yeah, okay, that's not really what I do. But the angry reaction, this is a serious point, pews he was, and shaking with anger. Because the Bible, that wasn't righteous anger. That was something else going on. So I felt sad for him. But I didn't start preaching in that way. Again, that highlights the importance of self-awareness, being honest with ourselves. Denial about anger and repression about anger isn't just for the type nines and the type ones. This is so important. Again, from that podcast series. Listen to this, if you would. If you shut down your heart from anger, unconsciously, if you block out anger, repress it, deny it, this restricts all your other emotions too. It doesn't just block out anger. You're unable to be so in touch with love and so on. Isn't it complicated? But good news. For the type 8, you'll remember the challenger. They're freer with anger, but not always healthy. Have you heard of the anger iceberg? Really interesting, the anger iceberg. It's a metaphor used in psychology to illustrate that anger is often just the visible tip of a deeper emotional issue. Please hear this, because it might apply to you. Like an iceberg, what we see on the surface is often only a small part of the whole. Beneath the anger, there can be underlying emotions the more vulnerable emotions, such as hurt, loss, fear, sadness, frustration, that need to be explored and addressed to effectively manage and understand anger. Otherwise, it's the anger bit. It's just like a, a beautiful harp. Bang, bang, bang. Just playing one string on a harp. Anger is a defence often. Culturally, for men, it's kind of like one of the only emotions many men have been taught you can feel. But it blocks all those vulnerable emotions, so we don't deal with our loss. It's a generalisation, but you get the picture. A reminder of the sources of help in all of this. On offer, there's therapy. There's spiritual direction, there's cognitive behavioural therapy, there's so much help out there. When I ran anger management groups in prison, with lots of very violent men, they would often say, it just happened, I just lost my temper. It didn't, actually. <laughs> you ignored all those emotions that were bubbling around, and you ignored all the thinking, you weren't aware of all the thinking going on in your head at the time, so part of their breakthrough was slowing down, recognising, their inner stuff, and sometimes it led to change. It's exactly the same for us. Learning methods to diffuse our anger, humour. When I used to visit my gran, who could say some awful prejudicial things? And as a teenager, in my righteousness, I'd get really angry. My sister would say, Mike, let's not get angry. Let's just pull faces at each other and laugh. So we would pull a monkey face at each other and end up laughing and diffuse it. Sometimes a sense of humour diffuses anger as well. Let me draw this together. Some important quotes, so please tune back in if you've tuned out. The immortal diamond. The immortal diamond is what you have inside of you, I have inside of me. It is your very essence, your goodness, that which God created. Richard Raw says this, This is your true self. It's part of you that knows who you are and whose you are, although largely unconsciously. Your full self is just who you think you are. 
but thinking doesn't make it so. Challenging words for that to come. He goes on to say, Christians don't often go on this inner journey. I think that's true, if I'm honest. Christians don't often go on this inner journey. Instead, they often end up trying to deepen their personal relationship with a very tiny Jesus who looks a lot like them. And he sings the praises of Jane Fonda, who came to the Christian faith. And she said this, I feel a presence, a reverence humming within me that was and is difficult to articulate. Richard Raw says, far too many religious folk do not seriously pursue this reverence humming within them. They do not recognise that something within them needs to be deeply trusted and many things must be allowed also to die. Not because they're necessarily bad, or their false self is necessarily bad, but this is my words, like that stone temple in Jerusalem, they've become outdated. Richard Raw goes on to say, and because all this perhaps cannot get them to where they want to go, there is a better path, a better direction. Spirituality tends to be more about unlearning than learning. Spirituality tends to be more about unlearning than learning. And when the slag and dross are removed, that which evokes reverence is right there waiting. Your immortal diamond, your essence, your goodness, you're made in the image of Godness, deep inside. I'm going to close with a prayer from Soren Kierkegaard. <laughs> you can say Amen if you like, it's very short. And now, Lord, with your help, I shall become myself. Amen. Worthy
So if you need to leave after these words, or um, there'll be coffee, then feel free to do that. But may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.